He is the executive director of Global Gates, using God's technology to do church planning among the unreached. My very great pleasure to introduce to you, bring to you, David Garrison. Thank you, Tad. Uh, it is an honor to be with you. I've heard about uh, new wineskins for a number of years, and to get to be a part of this with you is very exciting. I, uh, I bring you greetings from uh, my organization, Global Gates, and uh, as well as from uh, Southern Baptist. Um, Southern Baptist uh, started this camp uh, a long time ago, just a very rustic venture, and um, my mother, who's now 87 years old, I just talked to her this afternoon, I said, you'll never believe where I am, and I told her that I was uh, at uh, Ridgecrest, and she said, oh, I worked in the cafeteria there as a young woman. Uh, so it's good to be with you. I bring you greetings from Southern Baptists, and you may remember uh, Southern Baptists or Baptists in general. We, uh, we used to be a part of you. And uh, <laughs> I had to explain that to my mother. She said, do they worship Jesus too? I said, yes, mother, I think they do. Uh, but we, uh, we left in the early 1600s and uh, we, we miss you. Um, but I want you to know we are still united in Christ and so we celebrate that. Thank you. However, I did make a note of that bottle of wine and I will be reporting that later to the appropriate authorities. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a recovering Southern Baptist. Um, well, I want you to know that I'm also one who's in debt to Anglicans and grateful for the great legacy that you have of uh, pointing to the ends of the earth. One of my, and really the mentor that both Tad and I had was a, a, a godly Anglican man, uh, a bit of a curmudgeon, uh, but a delightful fellow named Dr. David Barrett. How many of you know the name Dr. David Barrett? You know, this, is, this would be great to his legacy because he didn't want to be known. He wanted Christ to be known to the ends of the earth. And to that end, he spent decades and decades researching every single people group on earth. And he kept a database, one of the first computerized uh, systems of analyzing every language, every, every nation, every tribe, every tongue. And he could tell you among any people group, about 17,000 that he was tracking around the world, whether or not they had any scripture in their language, whether they had any churches, did they have any Christians? If so, how many? Who was working there? And he literally showed us the ends of the earth. And for that, I'm grateful for Anglicans. I'm grateful for David Barrett. And... Um, I, I, we joke about it sometimes. Dr. Barrett passed away a few years ago, but uh, when I met him in 1986 at the University of Chicago, he was speaking at a mission conference. We went to a cafeteria, the, the dining hall, and I saw him sit down to, uh, to eat his lunch. And before he ate, he put his hands together and he bowed his head and he prayed. And I said, and I thought he was Anglican. I, I was amazed. <laughs> But we invited him over to our little apartment that night and we began talking about missions and my heart just got on fire. And he invited me to be his associate for the next year and a half. I was his associate at the International Mission Board where he continued to research and to define for us what was the ends of the earth? Where were the places? Who were the peoples? And he had a list of 2,000, 2,000 distinct ethno-linguistic people groups who had not only no gospel, no witness, no churches, they literally had no prayer of salvation because no one anywhere in the world was praying for them. And I became haunted by the ends of the earth, what David Barrett called world A, because he said it should be our priority. And it became something that kept me up at night. And I remember sitting in church sometimes and I would alphabetically go through this list of 2000, all of the A's, the Azerbaijanis, the Albanians, and I would work my way through to the Z's, the Zhuang people. And that became a passion for us. And within a few years, we had a list of the hundred least evangelized peoples. And the International Mission Board had assigned missionaries to each one of those people groups. 
And then when a few years later, we had 200 and there were missionaries assigned to everyone. And today I can say, we're trying to get the gospel to these, all the biggest groups, but there are still micro peoples and hidden people groups who have never heard the gospel. And one of the reasons they've never heard is because no one is praying for them. So the Global Prayer Digest becomes important, it becomes so valuable because it begins with prayer. And, and for us, when we were considering these people groups, our assumption was they're not Christian because they're resistant. They're hostile to the gospel. And so when we set out, uh, my wife and I and our two young children set out to be non-residential missionaries to Libya. We chose Libya because nobody wanted it. You know, it was a short line to go to Libya. Uh, but we, we call ourselves non-residential because Americans at the time could not live in Libya, but we could surround it. And so we lived in Egypt for a while. We would go down into the Western desert there and probe the border and talk to Bedouin who would go back and forth into Libya. We would go into Tunisia on the other side of the country and go down to the Southern island of Jerba. And there were Libyans coming and going. We would go to Malta where the Libyans would take the ferry boat out to Malta and we could meet them there and give them Jesus films and New Testaments. What we discovered all across that least reached part of the world was that people were not resistant, they were neglected. Many of them had never heard, they had never heard that God so loved them that he gave his only begotten son, that if only they would believe in him, they would not perish but have everlasting life. So I'm having trouble reading the screen in the back. You all bear with me. I'm gonna just look at this and I'll glance over my shoulder. David Barrett left us with the unfinished task. And when we went out uh, in 1993, we learned hundreds of ways not to win Libyans to Christ. <laughs> what I'm saying is we tried all the traditional ways to divorce spiritual laws, the friendship evangelism, the business's mission, uh, on and on and on. We were like fishermen going into a new fishing hole. We didn't know what they were biting. What was good news in their context? We did discover that Islam was the only world religion that was tailor-made to answer and defeat Christianity. So a lot of the standard answers that we had, they already had counters to, and we didn't know quite how to respond to that. But something began happening around 1996. We saw the first church planting movements taking place at the ends of the earth. The first ones I remember took place in Cambodia where we saw uh, a number of churches, dozens and dozens of churches and then they exceeded a hundred churches. And then on Hainan Island off the coast of China, a place that even the Chinese called the ends of the earth. And we saw a movement with 900 churches that emerged over just a few years. Another one took place up among Puri in, in Bihar state and Uttar Pradesh, one of the most densely populated parts of India in an area that was called a missionary graveyard. We saw a movement break out. And our missionary there, he was from Texas, big burly guy named David Watson. And Watson said, look, he said, I don't even know how many believers there are now, but we think there could have been as many as 50,000 baptisms in the last two or three years. And of course, everyone looked at that and said, well, clearly he has dinghy fever or he's lost his mind or he's just a braggadocious Texan. David, to his credit, said, come and see. A research team in went and did an assessment, and at the end of it, they said, number one, we've got to apologize to David Watson. Number two, Watson was wrong. We don't think 50,000 is accurate. We think a low estimate is probably 200,000 baptisms, and we think quite possibly as many as 600,000. This last year, a book was written by one of the missionaries, one of the Indian missionaries who's lived in that area all his life. And his enemies, the Hindutva in North India, are ascribing 12 and a half million to the number of baptized believers in that movement. These weren't resistant people. These were people who had never heard. A church planning movement is what we called it. Uh, another one that we studied, and these are all published in a book that, that I wrote in 2004, Defined it as a rapid multiplication of churches planting churches that spreads through a people group or population segment. We're now tracking more than a thousand church planting movements in various corners of the world. God is doing something in our day we could not have imagined. The numbers are growing and as they grow, we're trying to learn from them because I don't know if you noticed, but we're not having so many church planting movements here in North America. 
We may have had them in the 18th century, maybe the early 19th, the Great Awakenings, but now you have to look to the ends of the earth to see them. And so we're trying to take notes. For example, in Bangladesh, we saw 100,000 Bengali Muslims baptized. And so one of our missionaries there who, he went to these Muslims coming to faith, he said, tell me, what is God using to bring your people to faith in Christ? Teach me how to fish. And they taught him the camel method. And he wrote a little book called The Camel, How Muslims Are Coming to Faith in Christ. It shows you how to bridge Muslims out of the Quran and into the New Testament where they can find Jesus Christ. And another movement more recently in Southeast Asia, the, the assessment they did in January of this last year, the Global Research Department of the International Mission Board counted 130,000 baptized Muslims in a country in Southeast Asia. When we went to that situation, we said, what are you guys using? So we're using something called any three. So what does any three stand for? They said it stands for anyone, anywhere, anytime. That's when we share the gospel with them. Anyone, anywhere, anytime. And it's taken off and they've got multiplying. They showed me a sheet, a, a, a queen size bed sheet that they had uh, drawn circles for every one of the churches that had planted churches that had planted churches cascading out with multiple generations of churches planting churches all from a Muslim background the biggest one we've seen actually took place in uh, southern China Ying and Grace Kai Chinese Americans who felt guilty that they were so blessed living here in America that they went back to China and began sharing the gospel and realized it was just too much, too many people, 20 million people in their immediate area. And they said, Lord, wh what can we do? How can we, how can we reach so many? And God said, well, what's better than winning someone to Christ? They said, well, Lord, that's pretty good, but probably planting a church. And the Holy Spirit said, well, what's better than planting a church? They said, Lord, what's better than planting a church? He said, what about planting a church that plants a church? He said, okay, Lord, you got us there. And then God stopped them before they walked away. He said, what's better than planting a church that plants a church? He said, Lord, we don't know. And the Holy Spirit seemed to say to them, train others to plant churches that plant churches that plant churches. And this is what they started in the year 2000 in this area of Southern China. I won't say exactly where it is because we're recording this, but what they ended up with was Excel spreadsheets with hundreds of churches planting churches that multiplied exponentially until our final tally, we had 150,000 house churches planted, two million baptisms in a decade. Now, I'm a Southern Baptist. That means when we get reports like that, we don't believe it. So we were ready to call that couple home and retire them for, you know, for obviously misleading us. But instead they sent a research team in to investigate and what they discovered was, Ying and Grace Kai were underreporting their numbers by 40%. And we said, why were you underreporting? They said, well, we know that Southern Baptists have very strict standards. <laughs> and they said, we've gone into some areas. You've heard of the Foxconn factories there that make all of the uh, Apple computers. There's factories like that all throughout this area. They said, some of these factories have nothing but women, 30, 40,000 women in these factories. So we've planted multiple reproducing churches in those factories, but we know that Southern Baptists don't believe women can lead churches. So we didn't count any of those. <laughs> this is not that we don't think they're real. We just didn't want to be accused of counting things that you wouldn't call a church. They had another group, they said, we train, we'll train anyone who comes to us. So we had a bunch of Lutherans from um, Taiwan. They come to us, we train them. They went and they plant thousands of churches, but we don't count them. So why? So because they baptize infants and we don't, Southern Baptists don't do that. So he explained why they were under reporting, but God was doing an amazing work. I'm going to move quickly here. They've written a book now, Ying and Grace Kai's Training for Trainers. They're training all over the world and we're seeing movements as a result. One of the remarkable patterns we began to hear were reports of Muslims in significant numbers coming to Christ. And I knew how not to win Muslims to Christ. So I knew that this, this was questionable. And I was actually contacted by a foundation. Uh, the, uh, the, one of the members of that foundation is now the head of Missio Nexus, the largest mission umbrella organization in the world. And uh, Ted Esler called me up. He said, David, we're getting reports of Muslim movements to Christ. He said, I worked in Bosnia. You worked in Libya. You know how tough Muslims are. 
He said, I'm not sure if these are real or if they're just being evangelistically reported. You know what I'm talking about? And I told Ted, I said, Ted, the same question. I've got a list. My, my friends and I have compiled a list of about 25 movements that we've heard of, each one with at least a thousand baptized believers, but I haven't really visited them firsthand. I don't know for sure if they're real or not. And he said, David, would you be willing to go and investigate these movements? I said, brother, it's been on my bucket list for a while. So in 2011, I was released. I had in my mind, I was going to visit. I prayed about this 12 movements in 12 countries. I had 12 questions. You see the divine pattern here. I was going to ask 12 individuals from each movement randomly selected. What did God use to bring you to faith in Christ? Then I was going to write a book with 12 chapters and sell 12 million copies. It just seemed like God's hand was on it. Had I known what I was getting into, I think I would have turned and run the other way. I ended up spending three years working on this. I traveled a quarter of a million miles through the Muslim world into every corner of the Muslim world. I was able to gather not, not 12 interviews or 144, but over 1,000 interviews. By the grace of God and with the help of a lot of friends, I was able to visit 44 different movements in 39 countries across the Muslim world. The questions I had, I had about 35 questions. We, by the way, we've not yet sold 12 million copies, so get yours at the bookstore. Um, the core question is, what did God use to bring you to faith in Jesus Christ? Tell me your story. We were interviewing men and women who had been baptized. And let me tell you why. It's not because I'm a Baptist, but because as a Muslim, if you had a room like this full of Muslims, you'd say, how many of you love Jesus? Every hand would go up. Oh, we all love Jesus. Oh, look, they're all believers. No, 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 no. How many of you believe Jesus is who the New Testament says he is, who Jesus himself says he is, and are willing to follow him, die to an old way of life and rise to a new life in Christ? If you're willing to do that, then you're willing to die for Jesus because that's what baptism means in the Muslim context. So we went through the Muslim world, discovered that there's very different rooms in the house of Islam. West Africa is different than North Africa. The worldviews are different than East Africa. The Arab world has a different mindset than what's going on in the Persian world with whom they've been at war for many years. Turkey has a different worldview. Western South Asia, that's Afghanistan and Pakistan and Western India, different worldview, different history and experience, same Muhammad, same Shahada, same Quran, but a different set of values and worldview. Eastern South Asia with the Bengalis, Bangladesh, again, the Rohingya people, a different worldview. And then finally, uh, Indo-Malaysia, very different than West Africa. So we wanted to see where are these movements occurring? And what we discovered was there were movements happening in every single room in the house of Islam. It's as if, and, and you got to understand there's different kinds of missionaries in these different places. They're doing different, uh, different kinds of methodologies, but it's as if an invisible divine mind was orchestrating movements of Muslims all across the Muslim world. Now, I'm a, I'm a church historian. I, I've got a, a degree in church history, PhD from the University of Chicago. I, I say that so that you'll all go, ooh. So would you, would you do that for me, please? Ooh, yeah. Now, you know that PhD, see, I do that in front of Baptists and they boo. They don't, they don't have the same appreciation that Anglicans are much more sophisticated people. So I pull that out here. Um, you know, as you know, PhD stands for piled high and deep. And what that means, making an extraordinary historical statement, you better be ready to back it up. Because there's always some other PhD out there who will shoot you down and relish in doing it and write a paper about it. So I wanted to know, I got the impression that more Muslims are coming to Christ today than maybe at any time in history. But does anyone dare say this is historically unprecedented? Well, not without doing your homework. So I did my homework. I went through David Barrett's writings and his research. I went to a good Anglican friend who teaches down at Baylor University, Philip Jenkins. Wonderful, wonderful scholar. I had took him out to lunch. Would you believe this guy's wearing cowboy boots and a cowboy hat? He's in Waco, Texas, and he's got a British accent and he's a godly, godly man. 
But I shared within my thesis, I said, Philip, I think it's possible that more Muslims are coming to Christ today than any other time in history. And I showed him chapter by chapter. And he said, David, I think you've got it. I think you're right. I went back to the beginning. And this is a across the bottom, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th century, and so forth, all the way up to the 21st. And I wanted to record every time there's been a movement of at least a thousand baptized believers in a Muslim community. So I'm going to quickly race you through 14 centuries. Are you ready? It starts off pretty easy. The first century of Islam, its existence, there were zero movements of Muslim to Christ recorded among any denomination. I would have taken a heretical movement. There were none. No movements of at least a thousand baptized believers. The eighth century, zero. The ninth century, zero. Not until the 10th century, there's one movement. 20,000 Arab Muslims near the town of Nisibis asked to be baptized. We have that documented. I won't go into detail, it's in my book, okay? And then the 11th century, zero, 12th century. Remember, during these same centuries, there are hundreds of thousands of Christians who are being subsumed into the house of Islam and gradually converted into Muslims. Not until the 13th century, you get two movements. One takes place in uh, what today would be Palestine. Uh, William of Tripoli reports over a thousand baptisms. Another one takes place down in, in uh, Libya where Conrad of Ascoli reports 6,400 baptisms. Uh, Conrad of Ascoli was a Franciscan monk. We don't know a lot about him except that it said he, was, uh, he preached the gospel, he did signs and wonders, and he was impoverished. So he was clearly an early y -whammer. You could see that <laughs> from the record. Moving on through history, the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, the 18th century, zero movements anywhere recorded on earth among Muslims. Imagine that. In fact, Christianity was almost eradicated in Central Asia under Tamerlane, who wiped out 5% uh, of the earth's population, 17 million people in his lifetime, targeted Christians in particular. Not until the end of the 19th century, two movements take place, one in Indonesia, uh, Shadrach Surapranata sees a movement of 20,000 Muslims come to Christ. The descendants of those Muslims are still in churches today. The other one takes place over in uh, what today would be Eritrea, where an Islamic sheikh has visions of Jesus, gets a New Testament, reads it, and comes to faith in Christ, and then baptizes several thousand of his fellow Muslims. The descendants of those converts are still in churches in Ethiopia today. And then in the 20th century, some of you here I know even remember the 20th century. How many of you remember? Yeah. Okay, well look what happened. The first half we were distracted by the Great Depression, by uh, communism, by World War I, World War II. Not until the 1960s, the first movement and the biggest movement in history took place in Indonesia. Some two million Indonesian Muslims come to faith and baptism, still filling churches in Indonesia today. And it started something around the tail end, the last 35 years of the 20th century, we see 11 movements, more than at any time in history. Now that's our historical record up to the 21st century, and that's where I began focusing for a win in the House of Islam. What is happening in our day? My book ends in 2014. So it's really not fair to compare 14 years with 100 year periods. But look what happened in those first 14 years. Amen. Let's give God a hand, okay? I have since learned that this number is very conservative and the numbers continue to grow. So I'm here to say to you the ends of the earth, they're not just resistant to the gospel, they're really neglected. And there are people there waiting for someone for the hope within. And that's the calling for you to, to say, God, whatever it takes, we want to see the ends of the earth come to faith in Jesus Christ. Let me quickly move on. We've had Muslims of Christ in the 21st century, sufficient to say that we are right now in our lifetime seeing the greatest turning of Muslims to Christ in history. But friends, it's only just beginning. There is still so much yet to be done. So the final question I hope you'll be asking is how can we participate? Let me quickly share with you. Number one, you can pray. 
And there's lots of ways to pray today. I'm amazed by technology. We have a little uh, life group at our church. We call it T-O-T life group, T-E-O-T-E. Stands for the ends of the earth. And we use prayer cast. We'll go on and pray for a country and we'll also use Operation World. That's our textbook. We pray through Operation World. And if you haven't discovered this yet, 30 days of prayer for the Muslim world every year uh, is making a huge difference. During the time of Ramadan, when Muslims around the world are praying and fasting, Christians are now praying for them. And finally, if you don't know how to pray, let me encourage you, pray for Muhammad. You say, who's Muhammad? Well, he's the name of about one out of every five Muslims. You say, God save Muhammad. Then, when you go down to the pharmacy or the grocery store and you see the little name badge, Muhammad, says, I've been praying for you. It's a great lead in. Amen. Finally, I encourage you to learn from the body of Christ. Learn these different tools that I've shared with you because we're learning how to fish in a new pond. There's a new kind of fish there and God is, is teaching us new ways to reach them through discovery Bible studies, the camel method, training for trainers that Ying and Grace Kai pioneered, any three, any one, anywhere, anytime. And then, of course, a win in the House of Islam. We've still got 11,999 books to sell. <laughs> and finally, I want to say to you, God has brought the ends of the earth here. This is why we're working with Global Gates. It's like God has taken a fuse from the ends of the earth and he's wound it all the way around and it has a, a gospel ignition point in Harlem and in the Bronx and in Houston and among 40,000 Bosnian Muslims in St. Louis, 3,000 Fulani Muslims in Memphis, Tennessee, 100,000 West African Muslims in Harlem. We have opportunities now to light a gospel fuse through love and through witness and take the gospel to the very ends of the earth. We're now working in 24 global gateway cities and we invite you to be a part of that. I'm gonna close with this slide. Global Gates reaching the ends of the earth through Global Gateway cities and God bless our Anglican brothers and sisters. Thank you very much.